Hello and welcome back, Royal Family. We are in the end of September, Year of Our Lord, 2023. 9, 28, 23 is your date. 9, 28, 23 is your date. Your title is The Royal Family is a Bond for All of Eternity. That is your title. The Royal Family is a Bond for All of Eternity. Let me get this adjusted here. It is Lesson 140 of 1 Thessalonians, Lesson 140, a date 928-23. I do have a lozenger in. I did get checked out, guys. I appreciate the prayers. I had x-rays done on my chest. I, my, my doctor and I went back and forth. So there's probably something that I'm allergic to or that's yeah causing more allergies or more problems with my sinuses and throat. So um, he says, you look like you're fine. Not much we can do about it, but uh, I think I go back in uh, next month for some blood work in October or whatever, a normal uh, time of year when I would do a basic checkup. But he did do a teleconference with me, and he sent me down the road to get some x-rays on my chest, and nothing there. So that's a good thing. I appreciate the prayers, but it is what it is. My nemesis seems to be the ears, eyes, nose, and throat. You know, uh, that's, what, that's my battle, one of my battles. We all have them. So occasionally, because I speak for a living, you know, three hours a week I speak. And um, I have to, like he was telling me, take care of my throat, my nasal, my sinus patches, those things. He said, because you aggravate them when you ha already have sinus issues um, and you speak for a living. He said, you want you uh, definitely want to take care of the ears, eyes, nose, and throat. So... I'm doing the honey cough medicine or cough drops, uh, Vicks. I'm doing some tea with lemon in it. And that kind of stuff helps out a little bit. And the, the basic worst part of the cough is gone. I think I was probably fighting off a little bit of a cold coming on. But I also think there may be something that's causing me a little bit more uh, problem in my sinus area. So I appreciate you guys keeping me in prayer. No major issues with that. I don't think I have a lot of announcements, maybe one or two. Let me see. As a reminder, if you are not coming to the November Bible Conference, you're not coming to the November Bible Conference, I'm going to do my best to film the messages, but I cannot make promises that all the messages will make it up on the platforms. I've said it before. I'll say it a few times between now and the end of October. I'm going to do my best. It's a very busy weekend for me. I'm a one-man show. I do have some people rolling into town that week that are going to help me out. And obviously, my wife has always helped me out, but she works full-time as well. So um, I'll do the best that I can with all of that stuff. We'll see what happens. I'll probably get a couple of messages up, and then I'll have some problems. That's how it always goes. But we'll see. The week of the Bible conference, I will probably take that Thursday, November 9th off. I'll probably need that extra day off, Thursday, November 9th. I'll let you know as we get closer to the end of October, I'll let you know how it's all going to pan out and work out. So stay tuned. Keep rocking and rolling. Please keep the Bible conference in prayer. And all the information, the video for the Bible conference, the information is at prbministry.org. Go down to the bottom of that slide right there, prbministry.org. Go to that two-page website. You'll start seeing information and videos on there, things about the conference that you can um, gather and figure out if you want to come. You still have plenty of time. Listen, I've gotten flights up to New England from Florida or vice versa, you know, five days before I travel. Sometimes people get the great deals like that. And sometimes you make plans to, uh, within a two-week period, and it turns out great. You get your flights and your hotel and you have everything figured out. So if you want to do that, that's up to you, but you're going to start grinding down the time in the next couple of weeks. So stay on top of it. If you're not coming to the Bible conference and you don't get all the messages online, oh, well, I don't know what to tell you. I'll do the best I can. Um, keep that in prayer. I'm trying to think there was somebody else. I think everything... I've put out there recently is good to go as far as prayer. So we'll keep the same people in prayer we've been praying for the last couple weeks. There's so much going on in this world, plenty to pray for, folks. You can always contact me through prbministry.org. That brings directly to my email. If you use the email on the website, 
brings you directly to my personal email. So having said that, I think that's about it. Let's get ready to do the most important thing we do, which is what? Get into the word filled with the spirit. Two power options. Because in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory. Glory is the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And like newborn babes, long for that pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow in respect to your salvation. Let us prepare to take in the word of God. In doing so, we're going to read from the writings of the Apostle John in reference to naming and citing any known sins, which is the filling power of God, the Holy Spirit, to open up your new nature, your Christ-like nature. 1 John 1, 8, 9, and 10. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. The truth is not in us. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins, cleansing us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 10. Believers, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. His word is not in us. Take a moment of silent prayer. Name and cite any known sins. Wash yourself clean, filling power of God the Holy Spirit. Get rid of the distractions in and around you. You're getting ready to focus on the mind of Christ, Bible doctrine. And we'll keep the whole world in prayer. There's so many things going on. I could get on the list. But many of you know the volatility, lies, and manipulation and counterfeits out in the devil's world that we need to pray for. Every head is bowed. Every eye is closed. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time we have to come and study your word. And Father, we're just lifting up this lost and dying world in prayer today. We pray for many different situations and many people's medical and financial and, and problems. They've, they've been uh, stumbling blocks for people in front of people, whether it's medical, financial, or personal problems. We've been praying for one another. Father, we continue to pray for the Bible conference coming up in November. And we're praying for one another and personally, me, Father, I am praying, and in my prayers, keeping my focus on this little congregation going forward and how they lift up the ministry and keep your word going and support so many different ways with the things that they do, Father. I'm praying for them that they just keep going towards maturity. They do not quit. They stand strong in the trenches. They're prepared for spiritual warfare because they are in your word, taking it serious. Father, I'm praying for those type of students that go forward in the plan of God and that are elevating this ministry and getting your word out. Father, I'm praying for our, our leaders in Washington, D.C. We always pray for our leaders, whether we agree with them or not. Father, we pray for the seat of leadership. We pray for the seat of leadership. And we realize that it appears to be, by all accounts, a captured operation. There are things going on that are against the American Constitution and against the people of America. And Father... We just want to pray for our leaders that finally the light and the truth shine upon them, that they'll turn from their wicked ways and come back towards you. Father, that's all we can do at this point is be strong in who we are as Christians, affecting that circle of family and friends around us and become little leaders in our life. And hopefully that trickles down to others and eventually to our leaders. So, Father, we're praying for all these things through your son's precious name. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Let's do it. First Thessalonians chapter 5, folks. Open back up. First Thessalonians chapter 5. Today we're going to wrap up the first letter. I think this is going to wrap up the first letter to the church at Thessalonica. So having said that, jump into First Thessalonians 5, 23. And we're going to read through it. We're going to touch on some of the last couple of scriptures. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and I believe we're going to be ready to open up in 2 Thessalonians starting uh, Sunday morning. We'll see. See what God, the Holy Spirit, leads me. It's not up to me. <laughs> it's up to Him. We get through the notes and everything seems good. And tomorrow when I start digging and studying and getting into it, God, the Holy Spirit, leads me into 2 Thessalonians. That's where we'll go. 1 Thessalonians 5.23. Now, may the God of peace himself sanctify you, set you apart, he does, 
but sanctify you entirely. And may your spirit, soul, and body, important principles, the right context, the right thing in the right way, spirit, soul, and body be kept complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The desire, <coughs> excuse me, the desire for the Apostle Paul is written as accurate doctrine, spirit, soul, and body. That is the proper context. I think you've learned that in the last three or four hours. He is praying and desiring that once these believers get back on track, because there is an issue of false doctrine in that church, he's praying and desiring that once these believers get back on track, they will walk in a manner worthy of all the blessings, crowns, and rewards in the end. And that's what we should be praying for one another. When I say I pray for those positive believers that are lifting up the word of God and helping the ministry go forward, I'm praying and I'm having that desire that Paul had, that they can get everything working in conjunction, organized, harmony, everything in harmony, spirit, soul, and body, going forward in God's plan to receive all blessings, crowns, and rewards at the end of their race. And we all should pray for that for one another. Amen. The coming of the Lord Jesus Christ happens twice in the future. Many of you are well educated. Once and first is in the clouds of the air, the rapture of the church, which Paul was about to clarify once again to set up the confused believers because they were confused even about the rapture of the church. But the second, many of you know you're well schooled, would be at the end of the seven years of tribulation the second advent of Jesus Christ, when he comes down as the warrior king. The Apostle Paul is using a dual meaning because the truth is he doesn't know who's born again and saved and who is not. You don't either. I don't either. Truth be told. The Apostle Paul was well aware everything he wrote down would be used to establish Bible classes going into the future. So he's well aware this lesson is going to touch way beyond some of the believers at Thessalonica, and he's purposeful in how he writes these things down. We hope you all reach maturity. We hope you all come to salvation and reach maturity and go up in the rapture. But if you don't, we hope you realize the second coming of Christ at the second advent. You better be a believer during the tribulation period. So there is a little bit of a dual meaning mixed in there. 1 Thessalonians 5.24 Faithful is he who calls you and he also will do it. The present tense, many of you know the Greek present tense. Faithful is he who calls you. He's always calling all the time. Greek present tense. God is always faithful, first and foremost. And God, the Holy Spirit, is always active, working in a lost and dying world. I think many of you know that. God has always been faithful. Always will be. And he always remains faithful. His word is always exactly what he intended it to be through common grace. Many of you know this now. You're learning these things. Through common grace, God the Holy Spirit is always working to present the gospel. The Trinity is always working in our favor. Always. They've given everything they can for our success. We have to acknowledge and make some positive changes in the direction of God's plan and God's justice system. But he is faithful. Our triune God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, have laid everything out for us, and they're continually, present tense, being faithful and being there for us. So God has always been faithful. He will always be faithful. His word is exactly and always what it intended to be out and, and was set out to be. God's word never comes back void. Through common grace, God the Holy Spirit is always working to present the gospel. 1 Thessalonians 5.24 also said, He also will do it. Poieo is a Greek word. He also will do it is actually one Greek word, poieo. God is the one performing the action once we believe upon Jesus Christ. Not only is he busy calling us, but when we have that positive attitude, once we believe upon Christ, he's performing the action. He's taking care of us. He gives us eternal security. This points to eternal security. This verb is a future active indicative. Boyeo, future active indicative. God secures us and it's done from eternity past. Future active indicative is this verb, the Greek verb. It's one word, poieo. Poieo means a construction or a work is completed. A construction or a work is completed. 
Prepared or accomplished is another way to look at it. Prepared or accomplished. Eternal security. That's what this points to. Eternal security means you can never lose your salvation. I don't care what any other pulpit or denominational dogma preach to you. You One and done. If you truly came to believe and cling upon the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the only avenue, the small and narrow gate, it is Jesus Christ, then you are born again and saved and your salvation is secure. You have eternal security. The future tense tells us everything's going forward after salvation is secured through the power of God. He's got this. Amen? He's got this. The future tense tells us everything going forward after salvation, after our one free will decision, salvation is secured through the power of God. He called you. He did the work first. You answered with a positive volition. The indicative mood tells us this is done. He does the work. Future tense, indicative mood. He called you. You answered with positive volition. Your responsibility. The indicative mood tells us it's done. The work is done. <clears> 1 <throat> Thessalonians 5.25. And by the work being done, I mean eternal security as well. We're talking about that. Not just the calling you to salvation. Common grace, God the Holy Spirit. And then efficacious grace working in your favor. Eternal security. God secured it for you. You couldn't do it. He took care of it. You just became positive. Indicative mood tells us it's done. He's handled it. 1 Thessalonians 5.25, brothers and sisters, pray for us. Verse 26, 1 Thessalonians 5.26, look at what the Apostle Paul says. Greet all the brothers, it's really brethren, it says brothers and sisters, but brethren, with a holy kiss, which has to do with fellowship. It's not necessarily slobbering physically over somebody. It has to do with intimate fellowship. In fact, the way 20, verse 25, 26 into 27 is written it's really talking about intimate fellowship in the royal family. Notice, in closing, the Apostle Paul is pulling them together through unity of the body of Christ. The reminder of a royal family we are all a part of. That's the reminder, and he's trying to get the intimacy and the unity back there. He's got to reprimand them a little bit. There's certain things going wrong there, but he wants to make sure they're all together. They understand we're a royal family. We need unity. There is a fellowship, intimacy. He kept using the term brethren in the original context because that included everyone who was part of the congregation there. And it's really aldelphos, brethren, aldelphos in the Greek. Aldelphos is a term for brethren, meaning born of the same family. That's the simplest way I can tell you. Now, obviously back then, ladies don't get insulted. But obviously in the ancient times, children and women were not counted as important as men but Jesus Christ and the apostles elevated the women with the men, and they addressed things as far as the way God looks at the chain of command. They addressed them in the proper context. But when they talked about using that word eldelphos, brethren, they were meaning born of the same family. Born of the same family. Men and women. Born of the same family. We are all the royal family of God. The Apostle Paul wants the unity. Like, wake up. Even if you've been astray and you're a serious believer and you've been astray and you know you're a believer, you're part of the royal family. Have that fellowship. Have that intimacy. Come to the family. 1 Thessalonians 5.27. I put you under oath, he says, a command form by the Lord to have this letter read to all of the brothers and sisters, really brethren again, all the family. All the royal family, think of it like that when he says brothers and sisters, you see the way it's written. He's saying all the royal family, and this is a command or an oath, so it's strong. To adjure, it's really written in, the, in, the, in the, how it looks in the original language. To adjure, take as an instruction to examine and study the letter. So it has a little more strength in the original context than when, when, with the way you are looking at it. The original context of this scripture it's very strong. It is written to be a serious instruction or a command because when a command or an oath happens, it means there's a promise there. I'm telling you, you took an oath and you're part of this. And as an authority figure, I'm giving you a command. I want your word. You're going to follow through with the chain of command. So the original context of this scripture is strong. 
It's written to be a serious instruction or a command from authority to ones under the authority. The chain of command comes into view in this scripture, and we've studied a lot in the last two years about the chain of command. Brought a lot of principles forward about the chain of command and how that applies to all the principles underneath the authority. The documents that are written there, whatever instructions are left, they're all part of the chain of command. So the Apostle Paul is charging a command, like a leader, military leader, charging a command and wanting a promise, an oath, to be fulfilled. Like, I have your word. I know you're going to do this. You've done it before, but let's get back on track. You're going to do it this way again to be fulfilled, a promise or an oath. And that word used in the Greek is argenosako. Argenosako. This points to a full analysis, not just to read. This points to a full analysis. Now, I'm giving you a command. You're taking an oath. And what I'm telling you is you're going to study the right way. That's what this is saying, where the rubber meets the road. This points to a full analysis. This letter, like all his writings, were designed to be accepted as the chain of command for the early church. This letter, like all of the apostles' writings, certainly the apostle Paul, all of his writings were designed to be accepted as a chain of command for the early church. If he sent you a letter to a group of congregation, and he had it hand-delivered by whoever, Tychicus, Barnabas, Timothy, Titus, whoever it was, you could assume that letter and that man who delivered it was part of the chain of command, and you better pay attention. To repetitively be studied, that's what it means, to repetitively be studied, used for a template of teaching, it was a form of authority that should be respected, followed, and upheld very seriously. Argonasa'o, this is to accurately handle something. How often do we hear that? Accurately handle the word. That's what it meant. To analyze. When you analyze something, you tear it apart and take your time with it. You go into a science lab and they're analyzing something. It takes a months or weeks or it can even be years, depending on the depth of something, to really analyze just some little thing so they can figure it all out. So this word is act, accurately handling something, study, and fully digest something. Study, analyze, fully digest something. It is not to simply read something. So what I'm telling you is the way verse 27 is written is much stronger in the original context if you understand it. Much more commanding, much more strong, and it does not simply mean, yeah, read the letter doesn't mean that. If the word is studied and accurately handled and examined, the end result will be a pathway towards spiritual maturity. There is nothing more important than the word. There is nothing more important than the mind of Christ. If the word is studied, analyzed, accurately handled, the result will be a pathway towards spiritual maturity for the believer. All you can do as a pastor or a leader or anybody, really, even for your children, parents, is clear a pathway. Try to give them a pathway. They have to take the path, and they have to take responsibility. But you clear a pathway. You lay down a template. You lay down instructions and say, this is the right way over here. If you follow that, there's going to be some level of a success. If the word is studied accurately, handled, examined, analyzed, the end result will be a pathway towards spiritual maturity. A steady walk in spiritual maturity means the believer will receive the blessings, rewards, and crowns set aside for them. So if the pathway is there and it's laid out for you, there's no excuses. You have to take the pathway. You handle the things the right way. And a steady walk in spiritual maturity means the believer will receive those blessings, rewards, and crowns set aside for them. 1 Thessalonians 5.28 May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. The person and work of Jesus Christ is the exact definition of grace. The person and work of Jesus Christ is the exact definition of grace. You look up the word grace in theology, there should be a picture of Jesus Christ on the cross. The person and work of Jesus Christ is the exact definition of grace. The plan of God, a plan of grace 
was provided for man before man was created. God does everything in eternity past. Therefore, man cannot earn and cannot deserve this grace given to him. There's nothing you can do. There's no program, self-help, no way you can force yourself. Mankind cannot earn and cannot deserve this grace. Under grace, God does the work and man is the only beneficiary. Under grace, God does the work and man is only beneficiary. The person and work of Jesus Christ is the embodiment of the grace plan. You look at the life of Jesus Christ in Scripture. You look at the person and work of Jesus Christ in Scripture. It's the embodiment of the plan of God. It is God's grace plan in the flesh, blood, and sacrificial work and life of Jesus Christ. You see, a hostile world filled with sin and evil benefited from the birth, life, teaching, and death as well as resurrection of Jesus Christ. We all deserved condemnation. Instead, we got salvation. We all deserve condemnation. Instead, we got salvation. Grace is all that God is free to do for man on the basis of the cross. I'll read it all again. I know it's a big slide. There's a lot there. Pay attention to what I'm telling you. The plan of God, a grace plan. Never question that. God's plan is a grace plan was provided for man before man was even created. God does everything in eternity past. Therefore, mankind cannot earn and cannot deserve this grace. Under grace, God does the work and man is the only beneficiary. The person and work of Jesus Christ is the embodiment of the grace plan it is God's grace plan in the flesh, blood, and sacrificial work and life of Jesus Christ. A hostile world, because it is, a hostile world filled with sin and evil benefited from the birth, life, teachings, and death as well as resurrection of Jesus Christ. Bottom line is, this world as we know it and everyone in it all deserve condemnation Instead, we got salvation laid at our feet, and all we have to do is acknowledge the person and work of Jesus Christ. Grace is all that God is free to do for man on the basis of the cross. Grace is all that God is free to do for man on the basis of the cross. Turn to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 8, Royal Family. I'll leave that up there an extra minute. I know it's a big slide. It's got a lot of good information on it, folks. These are things you need to understand about God's grace plan. Jesus Christ is the embodiment, the person and work of Jesus Christ. When you look to Jesus Christ, you can see nothing but grace when you understand God's grace plan. Cannot earn or deserve it. Grace is all that God is free to do for man on the basis of the cross. Gospel of Luke chapter 8, please. Luke 8. As we close this first letter out, I want to make a note of the unity the Apostle Paul was writing about as he repeatedly used this term brethren in closing this first section of this letter. He's trying to pull them all together in unity and recognizing the royal family. The basis of royalty in the church age is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. All dispensations had the opportunity for regeneration, faith alone in Christ alone. All dispensations have the opportunity for regeneration, faith alone in Christ alone. It ensures a new life begins for the believer, eternal security in a resurrection body. It's always been that way. It will always be that way, obviously, until the end of the thousand-year reign of Christ. Yet the church age dispensation has a unique indwelling experience no other dispensation has. In fact, John chapter 7, specifically verses 37, 39, the Spirit came in a unique fashion after the cross and after the resurrection, ascension, and session of Jesus Christ. We're in a unique age as far as the indwelling of the Trinity, the power of God, the Holy Spirit. It's never been seen before. And John chapter 7 highlights this a little bit. The Spirit came in a unique fashion after the cross 
and after the resurrection, ascension, and session of Jesus Christ. So the, the basis of our royalty for the church age, we talk about a royal family, a royal priesthood, is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Very unique. Regeneration is always there. Born again, faith alone in Christ alone, since the garden into Revelation. The whole Bible tells us that faith alone in Christ alone is the only avenue. Not a works program, faith alone in Christ alone, a positive attitude towards the personal work of Jesus Christ. But yet the church age dispensation, the, the, our relationship with the Holy Spirit and the Trinity is different in this dispensation. That's the basis for our royalty. There's one body of Christ in the church age dispensation. And in this unique dispensation, we'll call the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, a royal family of God. We have unique callings in the church age, not often recognized in other dispensations. There is one body of Christ in the church age dispensation. And in this unique dispensation, we are called the bride of Christ. He's our husband coming back for the bride, rapture of the church, a body of Christ, and a royal family of God. You are unique, church age believer. Embrace it. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, the Apostle Paul tells them, For by one Spirit, not water, by one Spirit, baptism of the Spirit, for by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, church age believer, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit, baptism of the Spirit, Verse 4, for the body is not one part, but many. And that's what the Apostle Paul is highlighting a little bit in closing this section of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. He's trying to bring the unity together, the royal family together. You need unity, royal family. The future of royalty. As members of the body of Christ and the royal priesthood, all church-age believers will return with Christ at the second advent. Another thing that's unique. The future of our royalty. We talk about royal family, royal priesthood, the uniqueness of the church age. As members of the body of Christ and the royal priesthood, all church age believers will return with Christ at the second advent. We will participate in the strategic victory, the overthrow of Satan, plus the millennial reign of Christ. We return with the second advent to establish that millennial reign of Christ. After the millennial, the royal family will be, will be with Christ forever in the new heavens, the new earth, the new Jerusalem. Specifically, our abode in eternity is the new heavens. The new heavens belong to us as members of the royal family. You have to look at the uniqueness of the church age royal family. We're going to participate in the strategic victory to overthrow Satan and the fallen army fallen angels and his army and we're going to establish the millennial reign of Christ we're very unique church age believer after the millennial the royal family will be with Christ forever in the new heavens the new earth the new Jerusalem written about in the book of Revelation specifically our abode in eternity is the new heavens the new heavens belong to us as members of the royal family you have a lot of privileges in the church age, folks, that we don't see because it is an age of invisible warfare. This section of the Gospel of Luke you guys are going in is the early part of our Lord's ministry, possibly that first year and a half or so. So it's within that first year, year and a half of his ministry, more than likely. This was a parable in relation to a believer who has received the Word of God. What it points to is what the believer should do after salvation and certainly after receiving the core principles of Bible doctrine. Many of you come across the salvation gate, you start getting those core doctrines about eternal security and the filling power of the Holy Spirit. You start understanding those, at least you should be, hopefully being taught the right way. But this parable was in relation to a believer who's received the Word of God now. What it points to is what the believer should do after salvation certainly after receiving the core principles of Bible doctrine. Now it starts to make sense to you. Luke 8, 16. Pick it up in verse 16. That's what this parable is talking about. You're born again and saved. You come across the salvation goal line, the gateway. Now you know your eternal security. You have eternal security. Now you start looking at the different core doctrines 
that are going to elevate you towards maturity. So now what is he saying in this parable? Luke 8, 16. Now, no one lights a lamp. Your soul structure now is lit. After salvation, your light for other people, hopefully. And your light gets brighter as you get more Bible doctrine. Now, no one lights a lamp and covers it over with a container or puts it under a bed. Would make no sense. But he puts it on a lampstand so that those who come, they may see the light. A lampstand, you put it up on high, a stick standing up, a lampstand. He puts it on a lampstand so that those who come in may see the light. Believers are called to be a light for not only lost and dying world that's out there, but for other believers who may be heading down the wrong path. And sometimes I harp on this a little bit, and I think it gets lost on people because we're always told to go out into a lost and dying world and evangelize. Absolutely. big part of being a Christian is looking for those opportunities not to scare people off and hit people over the head with the Bible, but to look for an unbeliever that needs a little guidance and brought to the gospel, fisher of men, we're called to be, fisher of men in a lost and dying world. But what about the believer who managed to cross the salvation goal line, but's going in the wrong direction? Maybe they're out under some denominational nonsense or emotional nonsense, and they have no spiritual growth, and they're clueless about what Bible doctrine really is all about. So believers are called to be a light. Light stand, when you put it up high, if I put it down here, it doesn't light the room. If I put it up here in a dark room, the light lights up the whole room. You'll be able to see it from outside. Believers are called to be a light for not only a lost and dying world, but for other believers who may be heading down the wrong pathway. Many Christians refuse to be a lamp. Sad state of affairs, but true. Many Christians refuse to be a lamp on a very difficult pathway known as the devil's world. That's a tough world out there, folks. It's a tough battle we're called to fight. If you've been in Bible doctrine for a little bit, you've been born again and saved for a couple of years, and you're starting to learn, you realize that cosmic system is set against you. All the ideologies, all the things out there that are counterfeits and lies. So many Christians refuse to be a lamp on a very difficult path in the devil's world. Simply because they're either ashamed, which I don't get, but many are, simply because they're either ashamed of being a Christian or they have very little faith in what they claim to believe. That's a sad state of affairs as well. Listen, if you're brand new, you got six months of doctrine, maybe a year under your belt, I get it. You know, you're a little shy, maybe you're not strong in your faith, maybe you feel a little embarrassed about things, but there comes a point. Well, you should freely be able to say, yeah, I'm a Christian. I believe in Jesus Christ. You should freely be able to speak like that. And when somebody's going through something, whether it's an unbeliever or, or, or a believer that's lost, part of your conversation, you could, you could be saying, well, I'll pray for you. You know, Jesus Christ has the answers for you. Let me give you a Bible class. Let me, let me sit down and, and, and read a scripture with you. Let me give you a little doctrinal knowledge. You know, but simply because you're ashamed of being a Christian or you have very little faith, you shy away from being a light, a lamp, out in this lost and dying world, very sad state of affairs. Luke 8, 17. For nothing is concealed that will not become evident, Jesus Christ speaking, nor anything hidden that will not be known and come to light at some point or another. Nothing's hidden from God. Nobody gets away with anything. A lot of people say that. Well, so-and-so got away with something. Did they really? Do you know about all their personal struggles? Do you know that maybe two years down the road or five years down the road, something's going to happen to them that's going to cause them some great amount of misery, and then they're going to have to circle back around and get right with God? No one gets away with anything. At some point, whether even at the Bema Seat judgment of Christ at the rapture of believers, or... Obviously, at the very end, the great white throne judgment, unbelievers, all will be revealed anyway. All will be revealed anyway. You know, I think it was James that sent me an email recently. By the way, James, we're keeping you in prayer. We know you went through that car accident. Uh, anything you need, you know to contact me and let you know. But he asked something about the uh, great white throne judgment, if we're going to be there. I believe we are. I believe it's an, obviously it's the beginning of eternity. 
the great white throne judgment. That's it. Everything that we know about the earth, everything changes. Trust me. We go into eternity. And I believe everybody is witnessing the great white throne judgment. My personal belief. But at some point, whether you're talking at the very end, for believers, rapture of the church, which is the beginning of eternity for us, really. Bema Sea judgment, or the great white throne judgment, end of the thousand year millennial reign, unbelievers, all is going to be revealed. All will be revealed. Jesus is very clear that nothing is truly hidden. All things we say and do will be revealed at some point. Nothing is hidden from God, amen? I hope you all understand that. I think it's very clear in Scripture. Hebrews 4.13, And there is no creature, no, not one. There is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open, laid bare to the eyes of him to whom we must answer. Last part of that scripture is very strong. To whom we must answer. God has a way of revealing your own heart in many circumstances throughout your life. Amen? I can say amen to that one. God has a way of revealing your heart in different circumstances. God has a way of holding the mirror up to your face even when you don't want to look at it when we need it. In the end, it will all be revealed. God looks at the heart. Remember that. God looks at the heart, which speaks to motivation. A lot of people can do good things. God peels that onion back all the way, peels all the layers away, looks directly at the heart, the motivation, the little thing deep inside that said, I'm going to do this because of that. God looks at the heart, which speaks to motivation, why we do what we do, why we say what we say. Luke 8.18 so take care. <laughs> Jesus says, how you listen. For whoever has to him, more will be given. Whoever does not have, this gets people confused and is really not confusing. Even what he thinks he has will be taken away from him. Be careful of the arrogance of what you think you know and what you think you have. Jesus reminds us that spiritual growth follows momentum, positive or negative. Meaning spiritual growth can be stunted and go backwards, negative, or positive momentum and go forward. But Jesus reminds us that spiritual growth follows momentum, positive or negative. When we have the habits of receiving the word and living in it, being serious, being motivated by the word, that's what the two power options are about, folks. That you get filled with the Spirit, you're walking in the new nature habitually, that you're taking in Bible doctrine all the time. It's always circulating and you're building your library and your soul. That way when you do something, it's in the right nature with the right motivation. The Word is behind it. When we have the habits of receiving the Word and living in it, more is built onto that. Building blocks. When we lose those godly habits, they are extremely difficult to get back and you start to lose out these are the words these are the words of jesus not pastor rick these are the words of jesus not pastor rick don't tell me there's not winners and losers in the spiritual realm it's all over the bible in the words of jesus and the apostles jesus is clearly stating you can lose what you gain spiritual momentum needs forward motion if it's negative, it's backward. That's a loss. There's actually no such thing as stagnant in the plan of God. Some people say, well, I've just kind of been stagnant. No, you're going backwards. There's no stagnant. If there is, it's very minimal. A day, a few days maybe. But if you think, well, the last couple of months I've been stagnant, then you're going backwards. These are the words of Jesus, not Pastor Rick. Again. Jesus is clearly stating you can lose what you gain. Spiritual momentum needs forward motion. If you reject on any level or run from the teaching and study of God's word, what you have gained can be lost. You're constantly starting over again. Constantly. Luke 8, 19. Now his mother and brothers came to him and they were unable to get to him because the crowd was so thick around Jesus Christ at this point. 
That's why I said it's early in his ministry. Luke 8, 20, and it was reported to him, your, mother's, your mother and brothers are here standing outside wishing to see you. And the Lord said, oh my gosh, I got to deal with my mom and my brothers. I got to take care of them. Move the crowd. Let me stop teaching. Look at verse 20. It was reported to him. Somebody walked up and whispered, Lord, your mother and brothers, are they can't get in over to you. They want to see you. They're standing outside wishing to see you. They can't get in, Lord. Notice how Jesus handled it. He did not drop what he was doing, which was teaching the word. That was more important. Did not drop what he was doing. He didn't really flinch if you go from verse 20 to 21. He just was like, okay, kept teaching. Did not drop what he was doing, which was teaching the word. He did not get emotional. Oh my gosh, what are they doing here? What you, let him through, please. He was not rejecting his family. That's not what I'm telling you. But he was making a teaching point that all believers should fully digest. He actually turned it into part of his lesson. Amazing. Jesus Christ. Luke 8, 21. But he answered and said to them, My mother and my brothers are these who hear the word of God and do it. These who hear the word of God and do it. He was looking at the people sitting there and looking at those serious students, the apostles, and those other disciples that were very serious students, probably sitting right in the front. There's always a bunch of people in the back that are just there for the show. Jesus had a lot of people that were there for the show, and that mob thinned out, and many of them turned around and were yelling, crucify him later on. <clears throat> he didn't get emotional. He wasn't rejecting his family. He actually turned it into a teaching point. <clears throat> he answered to them and said, my mother and my brothers are these who hear the word of God and do it. Folks, there's a unity, eternal bond among serious students of the word. You see it at Bible conferences. We learn it as we grow amongst other people. The royal family is more than a catchy theological term. It's more than just a little catchy theological term, the royal family of God. The believer who goes above and beyond the normal, acceptable title of Christian, I'm going to repeat this a couple of times. The believer who goes above and beyond the normal, acceptable title of Christian by that, I mean what the world will accept. That Christian will never find unity outside of the royal family of God. You're never going to find that same kind of unity. Trust me when I tell you. The believer who goes above and beyond the normal, acceptable title of Christian, because there is. There's a certain level of saying, I'm a Christian, as long as you don't push too hard. You just talk about the God thing. You don't push that Jesus Christ and salvation too much. But the believer who goes above and beyond the normal acceptable title of Christian, by that, I mean what the world will accept without bucking. That Christian will never find true unity outside of the royal family of God. The world will allow you to be a Christian, even your family. The world will allow you to be a Christian as long as you go along with the current day narratives. When the current day narratives go against the word, if they look over at you and you start saying, well, the Bible says, oh, wait a minute, you've gone too far as a Christian. You're going to get into that truth thing now. Truth is relative to how you feel at any moment. Truth is singular. Anytime you hear somebody say truth is relative, you can correct them and say, no, truth is singular. The world will allow you to be a Christian as long as you go along with the current day narratives. But to be a serious Christian means you study the word habitually, apply the word to your life. That will always go against the narrative of the devil's world. So how can you be seriously intimate and have unity for a long period of time with somebody whose mind, even if they claim to be a Christian, goes along with the devil's world all the time? How are you going to feel that solidified intimacy with that person? The world will allow you to be a Christian as long as you go along with the current day narratives. But to be a serious Christian means you study the word habitually, apply the word to your life. 
That will always go against the narrative of the devil's world. Welcome to true Christianity. The Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was rejected by his childhood friends and his own siblings. That's a fact. I don't care if they were coming along to check on him or whatever. For the most part, his childhood friends and his siblings, when he was walking and talking around, preaching and doing what he was doing before the cross, didn't believe upon him. And many times they scoffed at him. Let us close in Mark chapter 6. Go to the Gospel of Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. Let me give you some examples in closing. So get, re get ready for this, folks, in your own life, if you're serious. Unless you want to go along and get along. John 7, 5, for not even his brothers believed in him. His own brothers. Jesus' own siblings did not accept his deity as the true Messiah until after his resurrection. He could go around and talk about things about the Torah and maybe become a teacher. They were okay with him being, yeah, my, my brother Jesus, my big brother Jesus, obviously first one born in the family, uniquely born. My big brother Jesus kind of turned into a teacher. He's not going to be a carpenter anymore. I guess I'm okay with that, but this whole Messiah thing, plus all the stuff he's talking about against the Sanhedrin, can't have that. Jesus' own siblings did not accept his deity as the true Messiah until after his resurrection they did. In fact, some of his brothers became pastor teachers. If your circle of family and friends are uncomfortable with your pursuit of truth and your relationship with Christ, you are not alone. Welcome to real Christianity. You're not alone. Making those people in your circle and family and friends uncomfortable occasionally. Oh, well, am I your enemy for telling you the truth? Mark 3.20. Look at Mark 3.20. Well, I got you guys going to Mark 6. Don't worry about it. I'm going to put 3.20 and 21 on the board. You guys are going to Mark 6. Mark 3.20. And he, Jesus, came home, hometown boy, and the crowd gathered again to such an extent that they could not even eat a meal. He was crowded around. He's back. He's been doing all this miracles and teaching. A lot of the crowd were just curious, like, what the heck is he doing? What's going on with him? Verse 21, and when his own people heard about this, meaning relatives and close friends, people that little Jesus ran around with as a boy, and when his own people heard about this, they came out to take custody of him. For they were saying, you teach the truth. You're the Messiah. No, he's lost his senses. He's a nut the ones who are closest to him his whole life. He's a nut. Grab a hold of him. Get him out of that crowd. He's making us all very uncomfortable. He's lost his senses. Jesus, in his own neighborhood, was rejected and ridiculed and made to feel like he's causing a scandal everywhere he goes. Don't talk about that Jesus thing, that Bible thing, that doctrine thing anymore. It's making people uncomfortable. Mark 6, 3. Look at Mark 6, 3. What were they saying in Mark 6, 3? Is this not the carpenter? Guy fixed my doorway four years ago. He built a table with his father Joseph back in the day for my family. Is that the carpenter? The son of Mary, brother of James, Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? That, that's his brothers. We know him. And are his sisters not here with us? They're around all the time. They're in the hood with us. And they took offense, it says, at him. He was a stumbling block for them. A stumbling block of frustration, actually. This was ver written, very frustrated group of people that grew up with Jesus. Probably even cousins and relatives and siblings saying, what's he doing? What Jesus was teaching and the things he was doing got them pretty upset. <clears throat> They were uncomfortable. They felt embarrassed. <clears throat> the original language, <clears throat> excuse me, tells us he was causing a scandal among the crowd. It was causing deep frustration. This is the best description I can give you. Stirring up great negative emotions. They were like, oh, I can't believe he's saying these things. He's here. He's been out doing all these things. Remember when he was just a little kid in the neighborhood? I know him. He's my cousin. He was my friend. 
What Jesus was teaching and the things he was doing got them very upset. The original language tells us he was causing a scandal among the crowd like a stumbling block, and it was scandalous to them. It was causing deep frustration, stirring up great negative emotions among people who loved him and knew him. You know, the old saying was murmuring and complaining. I can't believe he did that. I can't believe he said that. I can't believe he's doing this. And they just keep whipping each other up in frustration over him. The crowds were made up of his childhood friends, relatives, family members speaking out against him and actually whipping each other up into a frenzy over him. He knew he could see what he was causing. So he made a statement and said, I'm out of here. He made one profound statement and said, this is causing too much problems. I'm out of here. Sometimes you've got to do that. This is a part of the doctrine of separation. You speak your truth and say, I'm stepping away from this nonsense. Mark 6, 4. Jesus said to them, a prophet is always honored amongst his family and hometown. No. Mark 6, 4. Jesus said to them, a prophet is not dishonored except in his hometown and among his own relatives in his own household. I tell you all the time, there's people that know me and I, that grew up with me and even in my circle of close family and friends that won't read the angel book or the last book I wrote or won't sit and watch me and study under me. Get used to it. Jesus said to them, a prophet is not dishonored except in his hometown and among his own relatives and in his own household. Oh, well. True members of the royal family who align their lives under Bible doctrine will be rejected. If you don't like rejection, <laughs> Christianity is going to be a tough walk for you. Nobody really likes rejection. You know what I mean. But you start getting thicker skin because you know you're on the right side of history. Amen. You're with him. True members of the royal family who align their lives under Bible doctrine will be rejected, ridiculed, shaken up, causing scandals. Can't believe they said that. Can't believe they study that. Sadly, oftentimes by those who may claim to be Christians in their own circle of family and friends. A lot of people check the box. Yeah, I'm a Christian. A lot of yeah, I'm a Christian out there. I would venture a guess a lot of check the box, yeah, I'm a Christians aren't true Christians, never really believed upon Christ. They just said, yeah, yeah, I know about that Jesus thing. I believe in him. Okay. True members of the royal family who align their lives under Bible doctrine will be rejected, ridiculed. Sadly, oftentimes by those who may claim to be Christians in their own circle of family and friends. You'll find greater, long-lasting bonds with royal family members than your own family in some cases. It happens. I'm not saying in every case, but it happens. Sure, there's family members that you're going to love to the end and be there for them, but you're never going to have that intimacy to be able to speak doctrine to them and your true beliefs inside. Don't get discouraged. Don't get discouraged. In fact, this is a, usually a sign... You're heading in the right direction. As they say, you're over the target. Sometimes it's a good sign. Don't get discouraged. <clears throat> My lineage of pastor teachers being obviously Pastor Bob Grace Bible Church and Colonel R.B. Thiem Jr., my spiritual grandfather, Pastor Bob is my spiritual father, they often preach the doctrine of what they call no man's land. No man's land, like Job was in like Abraham eventually became in no man's land, the place of few believers, really, but serious maturing believers who are willing to separate from the pack. They do not go along and get along to make life comfortable in the devil's world. They simply do not. They are unique and always drawn together under the royal family of God. They are unique in no man's land. They are unique and always drawn together under the royal family of God. They start recognize other royal family members who are serious, and they can open up with them and have serious conversations and heart-to-hearts with them, and they know they're not going to be ridiculed and told, I can't believe you believe that stuff. Yeah, I know what the Bible says, but this is the reality. This is the other truth. 
You don't get that from another maturing believer in the royal family. If you're speaking doctrinal principles and seeking doctrinal advice, that's where you want to be. Royal family unity. Every head is bowed. Every eye is closed. Father, bless this message. Take it out to a lost and dying world. Through your son's precious name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.